Coming up next is the 2021 virtual conference, and we would like to introduce you at this time to Cheryl Bruno. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to panel session 101 on the scriptural periphery, perspectives on Joseph Smith's Egyptian project. My name is Cheryl Bruno, and I will be serving as the panel moderator. Our panelists are Christopher Smith, Susan Staker, and David Bakavoy. This session will be recorded, and there will be time for questions after the panelists finish. Please post your questions in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Christopher Smith has a PhD in religion from Claremont Graduate University and currently serves as the books manager for John Whitmer Books. Susan Staker lives on Whidbey Island in Washington State, where she reads, writes, mostly about Joseph Smith, gardens, rides the ferry, and walks her dog. In past lives, she did editorial work for Adobe Systems, Signature Books, and Sunstone Magazine, and studied narrative theory at the University of Utah. David Bakavoy holds a PhD in Hebrew Bible and the Ancient Near East from Brandeis University, and is the academic director over prison education for Salt Lake Community College. Let's turn the time over to Chris Smith. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar names in the uh, chat there. I just remind you that if you have questions, you can drop them in the Q&A section uh, at any time as we're speaking, uh, rather than putting them in the chat. That way, we don't lose them. All right, my paper is called Admission 25 Cents, the Exhibition of the Abraham Papyri and the Occultation of the Golden Plates. Occultation means the hidden, it, it's hidden, the golden plates were hidden. In 1835, Joseph Smith purchased some ancient Egyptian papyri from which he translated the Book of Abraham. Joseph Smith and his colleagues explicitly compared the papyri to the golden plates of the Book of Mormon and saw the papyri and the plates as two parallel documents. And he fitted these two records into a single dispensational understanding of salvation history in which every dispensation has its own sacred family record documenting inherited priestly and kingly lines. Yet there was also a difference between the two records. The papyri could be viewed by the public. They were physically available, whereas the plates could not. The papyri enabled Joseph Smith to fulfill several ambitions that he had had for the golden plates, but had never been able to fulfill because he was not able to make them available to the public. His study of the Egyptian language in the Egyptian alphabet and grammar and his public exhibition of the papyrus documents for an admission fee of 25 cents were both things that he had originally planned to do with the golden plates. So I'll start with the parallels between the two artifacts. Mormon scripture portrays both the Nephite plates and the Abrahamic papyri as family records. They were passed down in order to preserve knowledge and to symbolize the inherited authority of the priestly or kingly line in this patriarchal family. Both records trace that authority genealogically back to a forefather. In the Book of Mormon's case, of course, the forefather is Lehi, and through him all the way back to Joseph of Egypt. And in the Book of Abraham, the forefather is the first man, Adam. Both records suggest that priestly or kingly authority comes through some combination of genealogical descent and possession of the family records. You have to have the blood, the blessing, and also the knowledge of the forefathers in the form of a record in order to hold their authority. And both records periodically get sealed up during times of apostasy and then rediscovered during times of restoration. The Jaredite record gets lost and then rediscovered by the Nephites, and the Nephite record gets lost and rediscovered by Joseph Smith. And similarly, Abraham rediscovered the lost records of his own forefathers. And according to a comment by Lucy Mack Smith, Abraham's record got lost and then rediscovered by Joseph of Egypt. And then Joseph of Egypt sealed the record up in the coffin of Egyptian queen 
until it was rediscovered by Joseph Smith. So it's important that Joseph of Egypt is a link in the genealogical chain for both of these records, because of course, the Book of Mormon tells us that Joseph Smith is a descendant of Joseph of Egypt, and thus he is a rightful inheritor of both of these records and of the priestly and kingly authority that they document and that they confer. So these two records fit into a singular cosmic vision of history in which history goes in repeating cycles of apostasy and restoration. And the records are the genealogical through line. They're the links across these dispensational cycles all the way back to the beginning of time. Records make it possible for authority to be preserved through the apostasy portion of the cycle to be transferred from one cycle to the next and for religion to be restored. Joseph Smith saw himself as a patriarchal figure in our dispensation, akin to the role that Abraham, Joseph, and Nephi, uh, who rediscovered the histories of their forefathers, inherited their authority, and created new records of their own, uh, he saw himself as doing the same. He created new records of his own. He inherited the authority of his forefathers, uh, and he rediscovered their records. And as he created his own uh, records, he added his own records to this collection that he had inherited. For records to fulfill this function of uh, preserving authority across dispensations, it's important that they be tangible. And this brings me to the important difference between the papyri and the plates, which is that the papyri were tangible and viewable by the public. The plates were tangible too, of course, but they were kept hidden from the public. Joseph Smith was not allowed to show them to anyone except in the experiences of the witnesses um, or under a sheet. So what are we to make of that hiddenness of the golden plates? Well, according to some writers, the hiddenness of the plates tells us something about Mormon epistemology or about God's mysterious ways. Mormonism is somehow postmodern, they suggest, or anti-empirical. God can't provide evidence of the truth of Mormonism because he wants us to have faith. And so the hiddenness of the plates creates a positive void in which faith can work. And I think the Book of Abraham papyri refute this view. From the moment that they arrive in Kirtland, Joseph Smith displays them to the public as empirical evidence of God's truth. He points to specific parts of the papyrus, and he tells people, this is the handwriting of Abraham, the father of the faithful. This is the autograph of Moses. These lines were written by Moses's brother Aaron. Here we have the earliest account of the creation from which Moses composed the first book of Genesis. He and his scribes made a detailed study of the Egyptian hieroglyphics on the scrolls in a group of documents known as the Egyptian Alphabetic Grammar. In Nauvoo, Illinois, Joseph's mother, Lucy Max Smith, displayed the mummies and papyri to visitors for 25 cents per viewing. This is not the behavior of an anti-empirical religion. This is a religion that takes empirical evidence quite seriously. And in fact, Joseph Smith's use of the papyri helps us make sense of some obscure bits of evidence about the golden plates. So both Lucy Max Smith and Joseph Smith Sr. indicated that Joseph Smith meant to make a study of the Egyptian language in connection with the golden plates. Lucy said that he created a facsimile of the reformed Egyptian alphabet and sent them to all the learned men so that he could uh, ask them for a translation of the same. And Joseph Smith Sr. said that the last of the golden plates contained the alphabet of this unknown language and that Joseph Smith showed them to linguists in the hope of getting a translation. The implication is that he, the reason he sent Martin Harris to Charles Anthon uh, with a transcript of Book of Mormon characters is because he wanted Anthon to help him create a lexicon or an alphabet of the Egyptian language that he could use as a key to translate the plates. Nothing ever came of that in connection with the Book of Mormon, but that's exactly what he did with the Book of Abraham papyri. One of the very first things that Joseph and his scribes did when they saw the papyri, according to Oliver Cowdery, was to compare the characters on the papyri to the Book of Mormon characters from the plates and to note the similarities between the two languages. And according to the newspapers, Joseph claimed that the papyri and the Book of Mormon were in the same language. 
and that the characters on the papyri were the same as the characters on the golden plates. And in the cases of both the papyri and the plates, he said that the script was very compact or comprehensive, meaning that you could take one character from the language and you could translate several lines of English text uh, from just a single, single hieroglyph. And by creating his Egyptian alphabet and grammar and using it to translate the Book of Abraham, Joseph Smith seems to have finally fulfilled his old ambition to make a study of the reformed Egyptian language of the plates. And if it weren't for the papyri, we wouldn't know what to make of these obscure comments from Lucy Mack Smith and Joseph Smith Sr. about creating an Egyptian alphabet in connection with the plates. We, we might just dismiss those if it weren't for the papyri. But because of the papyri, we know uh, more or less what Joseph Smith had in mind in connection with the plates. As Sam Brown has argued, Joseph Smith believed that these sacred records preserve not only pure religion and pure authority, but also the pure language that Adam spoke in the Garden of Eden. And by studying the physical script on the physical plates and papyri, he hoped to access this pure language through the evidence that he had in his possession. More to the point, Lucy Max Smith's business of displaying the mummies and papyri to visitors for 25 cents helps us make sense of an early New York neighbor's statement that Lucy told her that after the golden plates of the Book of Mormon were translated, they would be exhibited for 25 cents per viewing. And without the papyri, again, we might conclude that this neighbor had been mistaken. Um, but since charging 25 cents per viewing is exactly what Lucy did with the papyri, we have to take much more seriously this claim that she had intended to do the same with the plates. And in fact, there's actually quite a lot of evidence that Joseph told his New York and Pennsylvania neighbors that the plates would be hidden only temporarily and that they would eventually be revealed to the world. For instance, uh, Willard Chase, one of Joseph's New York neighbors, says that Martin Harris told him that Joseph's firstborn son would translate the sealed portion of the plates at age two, and then after the sealed portion was translated, Joseph Smith Jr. would be walking through the streets of Palmyra with a gold Bible under his arm. William Stafford similarly says that the, the Smiths promised to show him the plates after the Book of Mormon was translated. And there's other evidence along the same lines that, that they intended to display the plates eventually. And in fact, the Book of Mormon itself explains why Joseph was not allowed to show anyone the plates. And the reason is not that God wanted to leave a void for people to have faith or that Mormonism is anti-empirical. The reason is that God didn't want the world to have access to the sealed portion of the plates until the appointed time. And we find this in 2 Nephi 27, 9 to 10. Joseph can deliver the words of the book, it says, but he can't deliver the words that are sealed nor can he deliver the book itself, for the sealed portion reveals all things from the foundation of the world until the end thereof, and must be kept from the world until the appointed time. So when we think about the hiddenness of the plates, we can't interpret it as an endorsement of postmodernism or a critique of the Enlightenment or a theological statement about faith. The epistemology of Mormonism is revealed in the public exhibition of the papyri, not in the hiddenness of the plates. The papyri allow us to see what would have happened with the plates if circumstances hadn't required that they be hidden from public view. And one thing that very much happened with the papyri is that Mormons cited them as empirical proof. When Oliver Cowdery first announced that the papyri had been bought by the church in 1835, he wrote that the illustrations on the papyrus must go so far toward convincing the rational mind of the correctness and divine authenticity of the Holy Scriptures as to carry away with one mighty sweep the whole atheistical fabric without leaving a vestige sufficient for a foundation stone. In other words, the papyri show us with empirical certainty that Mormonism is true and that atheism is false, and it leaves no room or need really for faith. So the epistemology here isn't one that calls for faith. It's one that calls for proof. Thank you. Think of today's presentation as a trailer 
the full version coming this fall to our own John Whitmer Historical Association. After purchasing four mummies with papyrus, happily at least one female, Joseph Smith, working with Oliver Cowdery and William Phelps, spends July and early August 1835 on an Egyptian alphabet and then a grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language. There, Joseph lines in a female character called Queen Kachuman, granddaughter of Noah, discoverer of Egypt, founder of a royal female line. Joseph spends more time on Kachuman than any other female in his canon. That summer, she overshadows even Abraham, who first appears in late July and only gradually takes over. So why have we lost her? Mere shards of her story make it into Joseph's canonized book of Abraham. She survives in the text marginalized by historians and apologists alike. Still, Queen Ketuman remains a marvelous gift to we historians, Joseph's vehicle for a startling range of explorations. To demonstrate his expertise, Joseph translates glyphs copied by his scribes from the papyrus, creating a provenance for Michael Chandler's mummies. One of a kind, Joseph's audition translation begins with a proper female name, Ketuman, organizes itself around her roles, princess, daughter of King Anitus of Egypt, and her timeline, born 2962, dies 3020. Joseph locates his Egyptian princess within an Old Testament timeline, 3,000 years since creation and Adam. Penciled on the back of his notebook, William calculates the age of the earth based on the Bible. Soon, jo soon Joseph follows these markings back to creation and Adam. The alphabet's first terms are the first being who exercises supreme power and the first man or one who has kingly power or king. Joseph's 1829 work on the Book of Mormon highlights an interest in sacred and ancient languages, the Nephites reformed Egyptian and the Jaredites pure language of Adam. Moving on to a new translation of King James Genesis in 1830, Joseph leaves Egyptian behind, but not the pure language. Joseph's Adam writes his Book of Remembrance in Adamic, which Enoch continues. In 1832, Joseph dictates a sample of the pure language. As Joseph meets the mummies, he's well into revising his texts for print. In the spring, Joseph revises an 1831 revelation, adding a grand family council attended by Adam and his living descendants through Methuselah, who lives to know his grandson, Noah. Enoch takes minutes in Adamic. By May, Joseph also updates his 1832 Adamic sample, now called a specimen of the pure language adding new glyphs and names and updating terms and definitions. Joseph's chance encounter occasions a mashup. He begins mapping his return to Adam's generations onto a story linking Adamic and Egyptian. It is useful to think of Joseph's Egyptian alphabet as an Egyptian specimen of the pure language. Joseph takes his princess into the alphabet as Queen Ketuman, proxy for Egyptian. Given that both ancient languages are sacred and mysterious, his Egyptian queen leads Joseph into uncharted territory. Early on, Joseph mobilizes authoritative male characters, seer, seers, angels, gods, as vehicles for epistemological and practical seeking. Such characters recur, accumulating a complex and intertextual platform for everyday scripts and increasingly radical theological inter interrogations. In the first part of his Egyptian alphabet, Joseph begins assembling a robust female character around the proper name Ketuman, the name of a royal family in a female line. She is a woman who sees, a seer, discovering Egypt while it is beneath, below, underwater, presumably near the end of Noah's flood. Her son settled the land. Joseph mirrors this first woman with the first man, both explorers of new land, both heads of lineages. Joseph sketches sacred plots for, plots for their mirroring stories from a beginning creation forward, from a pivotal point in time and end backwards. What Genesis calls the generations of Adam, first man through Noah and here a first woman installed as first frame for Joseph's Egyptian story. 
In the alphabet's first part, Joseph never quite tells an explicit story for his female seer character and her double, but the range of prospects is arresting. Joseph's Egyptian alphabet second part stages itself even more extravagantly as an Egyptian sample of pure language. Not only do Joseph and his scribes copy all glyphs from the 1835 specimen into their Egyptian lists in order, but they also include and extend its definitions for gods, angels, men. This gathering of content returns Joseph to a familiar landscape with male characters. No surprise then, Ketuman goes missing. Joseph finally gives his first man a proper name, exploring Adam's immediate descendants as ordained high priests, and for the first time within Joseph's surviving texts, calls them patriarchs. In late July, Joseph scribe William writes his wife that the papyrus contain the teachings of Father Abraham. At about this time, Joseph jumps ahead to the final glyph copied into his alphabet and finds Abraham, not surprisingly, a father, patriarch, and high priest. Joseph reprises this budding Father Abraham character in introductions to an I voice book of Abraham and to a more complicated grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language both began about this time. The Abraham character in these texts links and mirrors himself with Adam, both fathers of nations, framing encompassing rights and power from the first man who is Adam or first father through the fathers unto me. With, proliferate, with pro proliferating fathers and patriarchs, Adam through Abraham, now the frame, Joseph returns to his queen. Continuing with the grammar and alphabet, Joseph reconsiders earlier glyphs and terms, rereading each in order along the arc of five degrees. Joseph's staging of degrees is hardly structured. Instead, random, recursive, repetitive, sometimes dead-ended, and at its best, associational, generative, expansive. Immediately, Joseph makes explicit a story only implicit in Ketuman's discovery of land underwater. She is granddaughter of Noah, but daughter of his disgraced son, Ham. She inherits a record from the first fathers, echoing Joseph's pure language plots for his unlikely female character. But attention is now on her sons who inherit kingly, not queenly, power, but alas, no priestly blessings. Twice compromised, Ketuman's princes descend in a female lineage through Ham. Of note, Ketuman's significant other, necessary for sons, is missing. Perhaps a whiff of scandal combined, combined with a besmirched descent. Continuing, Joseph comes to stands for or signifies queen, the term which launches his sing singular female in the summer. In the grammar's alphabet, Joseph moves signifies into a muscular generalization for July's woman unmarried or unmarried or daughters, a term now morphing into signifies all or any woman, a fateful generalization substituted for our one of a kind queen. Given nature's logic, princes in a royal female line are sons, but so far the word mother is missing, despite fathers Adam and Abraham now framing the story. Along an arc of five degrees, Joseph's signification for all or any woman comes first to mother or mothers and sometimes the first woman who was Eve. Ketuman no longer Eve's twin, I mean Adam's twin, but Eve's. Continuing this arc, Joseph's language of beneath and under initially signifies signaling female discovery returns revalued as a sign for the subordinate position of all women under or beneath second in right or in authority or government. The biology trope gathering around mothering is extended as a fruitful place or fruitful vine. Women bear children, hence men are multiplied upon the earth. Subaltern ranking and biological destiny, now the two necessary sides of a female coin. As mothers, all women are above, more, greater, more glorious. Under, they are less, small, least. Alas, Joseph is not quite done exploring beneath 
below under. What happens when Joseph arrives at this original term now explicitly associated with all women can only be described as alarming and unexplained. The original term silently replaced with a principle that is beneath, disgusting, not fit. Along an arc of association, we find exceeding bad adultery, having descended below some other principle and then going down into the grave, going down into misery, even hell. I call this language alarming, unexplained, but Joseph deems it a principle. This detonation of a language of sexual danger cannot easily be recuperated into Joseph's Egyptian stories. That it is disturbing even to Joseph can be seen in his containing strategies. For example, talk about fishes swimming underwater. After this outburst, Joseph arrives at the term where the woman first sees the land underwater. He keeps his calm, but stages her exit from the Egyptian project. Discover she may be, but she is left standing at the border, unnamed, not quite entering Egypt. The land of Egypt, which was first discovered by a woman while underwater and afterwards settled by her son, she being a daughter of Ham. If unmotivated within the Egyptian project, where might we find such language within Joseph's canon, iniquitous, illicit sex organized around a male gaze on the female? Adultery rarely appears, except to underscore that it is forbidden by God and associated with the male gaze, whoever look, whosoever looketh upon a woman in lust, from the Bible into the Book of Mormon and Joseph's Law for his church. In Joseph's early Book of Mormon work, evil King Noah executes Abinadi for preaching, among other things, against adultery. King Noah is a magnet for evil acts. He has many wives and concubines and causes the people to sin, do abominable acts, commit whoredoms and all manner of wickedness. Later, a wicked Jaredite is similarly associated with whoredoms and abominations of many wives and concubines. Nearing the end of Joseph's dictation, Nephi's brother Jacob expands on the evil practice of Nephite men, quoting God's condemnation of the grosser crime. Men following old time Kings David and Solomon to the, in the matter of many wives. God aligns himself with the sorrowing and mourning women with cries of the daughters over the wickedness and abomination of the husbands. Says Jacob, this practice is more filthy than anything the Lamanites do. Fornication and lasciviousness and every kind of sin. No sins of fornication or grosser crime appear within Joseph's new translation completed 1833. So the explosion of sex language within his Egyptian project is surprising, but not unparalleled that summer. Joseph suspends the Egyptian project mid-August for a trip to Michigan. While gone, his scribes are among those presiding at a public meeting accepting the doctrine and covenants. A text called Marriage its authorship variously linked to both Oliver and William is presented introducing church views and a ceremony. Marriage also echoes back to Nephi grosser crimes. Inasmuch as this church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman, but one husband. Crime, fornication, polygamy, all sounding very like the principle leading to hell, adultery, things disgusting. Although absent, Joseph publicly warrants the book and depends on the ceremony and its views on marriage. Given where Joseph and Father Abraham take the church in secret Nauvoo, this text is at least provocative. The word adultery does not appear, but chimes with fornication, defined at the time as criminal conversation between a married man and an unmarried woman, see adultery. Given the August text confluence on fornication and adultery, it seems likely, likely such allegations titillate Kirtland's gossip circuits by the time Joseph leaves town. By summer 1836, a struggle between Emma and Joseph over Fanny Alger living in their home erupts into public view. Emma apparently catches Joseph alone with Fanny and Oliver is called to help, 
It is likely that Fanny, still in her teens, is pregnant. She is whisked from Kirtland and married off, what Oliver later calls a dirty, nasty, filthy scrape, is core to his excommunication in 1838. The language of adultery is prominent at his trial, though Oliver wiggles out of using the term. Later that year, writing from Liberty Jail, Joseph himself links charges of adultery, lasciviousness, abominations, and a community of wives as he reconsiders Kirtland and defends himself against the devil and his emissaries, the dissenters. Assuming Joseph's and Fanny's liaison services in 1836, then it seems likely similar charges turn up the year before, given our mirroring texts. Perhaps Joseph leaves town to escape nasty whispers. That seems his approach in 1836, when the scrape with Fanny goes public. An 1835 event establishes a likely backdrop for the vituperative language of adultery, things disgusting, bad, that erupts into Joseph's consideration of all or any woman, a final sad made male frame. In fall 1835, Joseph resumes Abraham's I Voice book. Katuman's name is gone, only traces of her fractured story endure. The daughters of King Anitus return as virgins, sacrificed to Egyptian gods. Renamed, Egyptus discovers Egypt. Her mother, a new character, wife of Ham, named Zepta. The sons of Egyptus from pharaohs, not queens, settle Egypt. Egyptus still has no significant other. Now Abraham preserves the pure language record. Father center Abraham's story, Joseph looking for a plot from Abraham's idolatrous father back to the patriarchal order founded by Adam. Joseph falls into a familiar pattern, mapping Abraham's story to Genesis, and so introduces the second female character, Abraham's wife, Sarah, Within Genesis, a central conundrum is God's promise to Abraham of seed innumerable as heaven's stars juxtaposed with Abraham and Sarah in a declining age with no children. Joseph quietly leaves out of Abraham's book the salient detail from Genesis that Sarah is barren with no child. This omission suggests that Joseph is still backing away, containing biological and sexual complications involving women. Into Nauvoo, Sarah remains a wife, but never quite a mother. A reverse image for our queen, mother, mother never quite wife. Sarah stars in the final incident from Genesis, Joseph considers as he resumes work on his Egyptian project in the spring of 1842. As the couple approaches Egypt, God tells Abraham to lie, call his wife his sister because she is a very fair woman to look upon. Joseph's God adds very to a notion ascribed in Genesis to Abraham. The male gaze is no longer a source of crime and sin. Rather, Abraham and God align in the messiest of human affairs, secrets and lies involving male desire and marriage. Joseph enlists this man and his wife one final time in 1843 in his revelation on many wives and concubines. The law of Sarah is a new gendered principle. God requires a wife to give her husband many wives. Joseph's wife Emma to follow the script or be damned. The loss of Queen Ketuman, this ending for Joseph's Egyptian project ladies, cause for mourning by the daughters. Hello, I'm hoping people can hear me. Yes, You're we good, can. good, David. Okay, good, thank you. I am so grateful to be a part of this wonderful panel. Thank you so much, Chris and Susan, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, I've had some technical difficulty and yet I am ready to go. My presentation focuses on the importance of biblical scholarship and how it helps us as historians to contextualize the book of Abraham. I'll also explain why that is significant and important because when things are taken out of context, by definition, we change their meaning. Hence, identifying the significance and import and the actual contextualization of the book of Abraham as 19th century scripture helps us to interpret its meaning as it originally functioned. 
Let's just consider, for example, uh, Abraham and his story as it appears in the book of Genesis, which is what is used to revise and, and create ultimately the book of Abraham. The story of Abram or Abraham appears in Genesis, the first book of the Hebrew Bible. Genesis introduces Abraham at the conclusion of chapter 11, and his account continues until describing Abraham's death in Genesis 25, 7 through 12. The story begins with God calling Abraham to leave his homeland and journey to the land of Canaan. God promises that Abraham will receive two blessings, seed, meaning posterity, and land. Ultimately, the two divine blessings function as a, a complementary unit. For example, what good would a large posterity prove an ancient patriarch without land to put it on? Similarly, what good would it be for a patriarch to own land for perpetuity without posterity to bequeath it to? The story of Abraham appears as a continuous literary cycle in the Hebrew Bible, where God extends the the promise to Abraham of seed and posterity, and then a challenge occurs that threatens one or both of God's promises. For instance, immediately after Abraham arrives in the promised land, there is a famine that threatens his ability to own the territory. Thus, Abraham leaves the land and journeys to Egypt where he loses his beautiful wife Sarai, which threatens his ability to obtain the posterity God promised. Yet Abraham eventually returns to the land with Sarai, and God then renews the promise. Sorry. Um, and uh, continuing. Um, sorry, continuing with technical difficulties. Um, for instance, immediately after Abraham arrives in the promised land, there is a famine that threatens his ability to own the territory. Thus, Abraham leaves the land and journeys to Egypt, where he loses his beautiful wife, Sarai, which threatens his ability to obtain the, pros the posterity God promised. Yet Abraham eventually returns to the land with Sarai, and God then renews the promise of land and seed. This cycle of divine promise, covenant frustration, followed by re covenant renewal, transpires again and again repeatedly throughout the Abraham story, until readers reach Genesis 24, which states, ironically, that Abraham was old, advanced in years, and the Lord had promised Abraham in, or, sorry, had blessed Abraham in all things. The organization of the narrative in the Bible suggests that it is a highly structured literary account rather than an historical biographical record. Even the story of a Jewish ancestor who leaves Babylon and enters the promised land serves as an obvious literary reversal of the Jewish exile from Canaan into Babylon in 586 BCE. So, is this literary account in the Bible based upon a real historical person from the past? History requires evidence. And for the actual existence of the biblical patriarchs, historians do not possess any of it beyond the traditions featured in the book of Genesis. Historians cannot show that the men Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob actually existed. Now, there's little doubt that the stories concerning these figures, at least in part, derive from oral tradition. The written sources that appear in Genesis cannot be dated earlier than the 9th or 8th centuries BCE, some perhaps even much later. These sources were originally composed in Hebrew, and Hebrew did not exist as a written language until the 10th or possibly 9th century BCE. The internal chronology of the Bible indicates a date of around 2100 BCE for Abraham and approximately 1876 for his grandson Jacob's move down into Egypt. Hence, if Abraham was a real person from the past, this would mean that the stories about him in Genesis derive from oral traditions that circulated for basically a thousand years before they were eventually put into writing. It seems difficult to imagine that oral tradition could preserve authentic historical events over such a vast period of time. An oral tradition told about an ancient ancestor over a thousand year period would be more myth than history. Moreover, the story of Abraham is filled with anachronisms that illustrate that the account should not be labeled as history. For example, the Philistines are mentioned in the Genesis stories, even though they did not appear in the land until the 12th century. 
Likewise, the Armenians assume a prominent role in the Genesis account concerning Jacob, Abraham's grandson, yet they are only attested in the 11th century BCE. Abraham's story mentions the town of Beersheba, yet we know from archaeological evidence that Beersheba was not settled before the 12th century. These types of anachronisms appear throughout the book of Genesis. They certainly call into question the historical reliability of its stories. In fact, the Bible actually provides scholars with evidence that Abraham was not a real historical person. The Bible does not contain any reference to Abraham in the writings of Israel's 8th and 7th century prophets. The prophets know other traditions from Genesis, traditions such as Sodom and Gomorrah, the story of Jacob and Esau, and the exodus from Egypt and, and Israel's wanderings. All of these are mentioned by those prophets. Yet there is not a single reference to Abraham until the biblical books that date to the 6th century or later. This, for historians, is very surprising. Surprising for the most important figure in Genesis. If Abraham was known, why? Why wouldn't any of these prophets have mentioned him? Moreover, the two names, Abram and Abraham, that appear in Genesis may in fact reflect traditions about different people blended together in the biblical account. Stories about these men probably existed from 10th or 11th century BCE and were transmitted orally or in form of story poems similar to the so-called Song of the Sea in Exodus chapter 15. Some biblical scholars maintain that the traditions concerning the patriarchs were originally independent ancestral stories that were combined in the Genesis sources in order to define the relationship of the people of Israel to one another. According to this theory, the patriarchal history may have been developed as a way to link the people of the land together for political reasons. Scholars theorize that the ancestor stories were created in such a way to connect the origins of Israel with Mesopotamia, Abraham's original homeland, rather than the land of Canaan. Genesis insists on distinguishing Israelites from Canaanites, who are defined throughout the Hebrew Bible as slaves and sexual deviants. The archaeological record, however, tells a different story. The Israelites were Canaanites. Reading the patriarchal stories from this perspective provides scholars who adopt this view with a whole new meaning to the biblical traditions. In addition to these questions that arise for us as historians as we consider the significance of Abraham and his traditions as they appear in the Hebrew Bible is the fact that the stories about him derive from separate historical sources blended together by an editor into the book of Genesis. It is these traditions that are harmonized and presented in the LDS book of Abraham as one unified tradition uh, as, and penned as if it were by Abraham himself. However, uh, and I'm skipping forward in light of our time, but the mere fact that the book of Abraham presents Abraham uh, telling two separate creation stories, Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 2, 4a, which is the so-called priestly account, and indeed the Yahwistic tradition of creation, which includes the story of Adam and Eve. This tells us that, in fact, these traditions could not have been composed by Abraham himself, even if he was a historical person. I'm going to skip forward and talk about why this is meaningful for us as historians and how this helps us to interpret this important scriptural record produced by Joseph Smith. Once we understand through biblical scholarship that the book of Abraham is not in fact an ancient source about composed by a real historical figure from the past, we are able to properly contextualize it and put this record into the 19th century and see what the prophet Joseph Smith was doing with the scriptural account. Properly identifying Joseph Smith's literary productions as 19th century religious works allows historians to contextualize and learn from the Book of Abraham, Book of Mormon as well, and learn from them we should, especially in terms of religion, spirituality, and racism. Like many 19th century Americans, Joseph Smith took the Bible very seriously. He believed it contained a history of the cosmos, the earth, and human origins. Smith assumed that all human beings were descendants of one of Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Yet the problem for Americans who embraced this traditional 19th century perspective was that the indigenous people of America were 
left without origin. One of the reasons Smith created the Book of Mormon was to link the indigenous people of America with the Bible's history of humanity. The Book of Mormon presents the 19th century perspective that darker skin derives from a divine curse for displeasing God. Hence, Mormon apologists, I would argue, do considerable damage to the text and our history when they seek to cover this fact up to match contemporary perspectives. The reason this controversial notion appears in the Book of Mormon is because Joseph Smith believed that the Bible contained a record of human origins. It therefore needed to account for racial distinctions. An important part of Smith's work, therefore, was to fill in what he perceived as the missing biblical data for human history. As critical historians reading Smith's work, we see a similar effort in his Book of Abraham. The account contains the following story regarding the origins of ancient Egypt. Quote, now this king of Egypt was a descendant from the loins of Ham and was a partaker of the blood of the Canaanites by birth. From this descent sprang all the Egyptians, and thus the blood of the Canaanites was preserved in the land, the land of Egypt being first discovered by a woman who was the daughter of Ham and the daughter of Egyptus, which is the Chaldean signifies, which in the Chaldean signifies Egypt, which signifies that which is forbidden. That's the book of Abraham, chapter 1, 21 through 23. Note that in Smith's Abraham, chapter 1, a direct ethnic link is made between the Egyptians and the Canaanites. This reflects a very significant 19th century perspective that stems from Smith's understanding of the Bible. Like many of his contemporaries, Smith believed that all of humanity derived from one of Noah's three sons. According to this mindset, those of African ancestry who had darker skin than Europeans came from this same ancestry, meaning the ancestry of, of Canaan. But of course, their pigmentation required an explanation that the biblical account omits. In terms of Noah and his three sons, Genesis contains a story regarding Ham's sexual depravity. In its historical context, the account provides one of several biblical examples of authors attempting to depict the indigenous population of Canaan as sexual deviants. Because of Ham's action, Noah cursed Ham's son Canaan, the ancestral father of the Canaanite people. From Genesis chapter 9, we read, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. White Americans during Joseph Smith's day used this passage to justify the practice of African slavery. African people were thought to have been the recipients of this Canaanite curse and therefore meant to be slaves according to divine mandate. Returning to Smith's Book of Abraham, we see his effort to fill in the missing data linking ancient Egypt with Canaanite ancestry. During Smith's day, Eurocentric anthropologists used the term Hamites for North African people. Beginning in the 19th century, scholars typically classified the Hamitic race as a subgroup of the Caucasian race, alongside the Aryan race and the Semitic people. This 19th century white supremacist view grouped the non-Semitic populations native to North Africa and the Horn of Africa, including the ancient Egyptians, as descendants of Ham. And this constituted a perspective Americans inherited from Jews and Christians during the Middle Ages, who considered Ham to be the ancestor of all Africans. Noah's curse on Canaan began to be interpreted as having caused visible racial characteristics in all of Ham's offspring, most notably dark skin. However, by the time of Joseph Smith, something had changed. In 1798, Napoleon invaded Egypt. This event drew Western European attention to the impressive achievements of ancient Egypt. It became a land of mystery and wonder. Structures like the pyramids were difficult for Europeans to reconcile with their belief that Africans were inferior or cursed. During Smith's era, a revised Hamitic theory had become popular. The Hamitic race was thought to be superior to or more advanced than the Negroid populations of sub-Saharan Africa. And with this historical context, we can see what Smith was doing with the Book of Abraham. Smith needed to link the Canaanites with the Egyptians to explain the biblical curse of slavery and dark skin. But he also needed to deal with the fact that the Egyptians produced such impressive achievements respected by 19th century Americans. The Egyptian scrolls purchased in 1835 gave Smith the opportunity to make these links. Abraham 1 verse 21. 
Now this king of Egypt was a descendant from the loins of Ham and was a partaker of the blood of the Canaanites by birth, end of quote. So the Egyptian king in Smith's account was a descendant of Ham. He therefore preserved the, cur the, the skin found in those of African ancestry that God gave as a curse to Ham's son. As a partaker of the blood of the Canaanites, the Pharaoh also preserved God's curse that he and his posterity would be slaves. And this, of course, explains why the Egyptian priest, in fact, similarly one in the book of Abraham, has black skin. Yet remember, during Smith's day, the Hamitic race theory had to incorporate the impressive features of Egyptian society. So what does the book of Abraham do? Smith's work fills in the missing data. He declares that Egypt was first discovered by a woman who was the daughter of Ham and the daughter of Egyptus. She settled her sons in it. And thus from Ham sprang that race, which preserved the curse in the land. And I'm quoting verse 24. According to Smith's story, the first government of Egypt was established by Pharaoh, who was a righteous man, a righteous man who sought to imitate that order established by the fathers in the first generations, in the days of the first patriarchal reign, even in the reign of Adam and also of Noah, his father who blessed him with the blessings of the earth and with the blessings of wisdom, but cursed him as pertaining to the priesthood. And that's verses 25 through 26. As a man of African ancestry, Pharaoh was black, and he therefore preserved the lineage by which he could not have the right of priesthood. Yet because he was righteous and imitated the government of Noah, Pharaoh was able to create a civilization that produced such impressive achievements. The Book of Abraham narrative reflects the 19th century view of this Hamitic race theory, and it fills in the gaps missing from the Bible as interpreted by Smith and many of his contemporaries. Um, I will conclude then and simply just provide this as an illustration for why I believe it is so important to contextualize the Book of Abraham as 19th century scriptural um, as a 19th, script, 19th century scriptural production produced by Joseph Smith, because by identifying the context and the setting, we are able as historians to go in and see some of the problems in the text. Not only is that helpful to historians, I would argue then that it would be helpful for religious readers of the text so that they can engage this critically and, and look at it and, and learn from it and improve their understanding not only of the Bible and of Abraham in terms of historical interpretation, but also in terms of the challenges and problems that Joseph Smith's scriptural records produce when they adopt 19th century racist views and perspectives. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, David. We have a few more minutes left and a couple of questions. So if all of our presenters will come back on. I'll ask um, the first question is by Julianne Briscoe, and she's asking Chris, what would 25 cents be in today's time? It seems that price would be quite expensive to view the papyrus. Yeah, so there are uh, inflation calculators uh, on the internet that will give you an answer to this question. And the answer that they give is somewhere between nine and $10. Um, the use, though, of those inflation calculators uh, for anything before about 1913 is super dubious because uh, it's just not strictly comparable. We live in a very different kind of economy. Um, if you look at sort of what the average wage was at the time, um, you were making anywhere from like one to two dollars a day, typically. Um, and so if you look at the median wage today and the median wage then, you're probably looking at somewhere like in the neighborhood of twenty or thirty dollars uh, in terms of you know percentage of wage, your daily wage. So something you know probably between ten and thirty dollars is like a reasonable uh, assessment of what that might have been. So it wasn't cheap. No, it wasn't cheap. But you know, you go to museums today and you might pay that uh, to get in. So ten dollars. Um, you might not. Uh, you might see more in a museum today if you went and paid ten to thirty dollars uh, than you would have if you had gone to see Lucy Mac Smith. But on the other hand, when you went to see Lucy Mac Smith, you got a personal tour from Lucy Mac Smith, and she got to tell you all about uh, what Abraham and Joseph had written 
on the papyrus. So maybe it was uh, better than a, your typical museum that you go to today. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. We have another um, question by Michael Riggs. And um, he asks, while the Book of Abraham was basically dumped into Joseph's lap and was clearly ancient in origin, the Book of Mormon plates would have been rightly scrutinized differently by outsiders. Joseph claimed they were made of gold as well, so they would have been considered very valuable, subject to theft, not merely a curiosity as with the Book of Abraham. That's more of a comment, but does anyone want to uh, sure. comment yeah. on that? Yeah, so you're right. Um, there are, you know, lots of reasons why Joseph might have wanted to keep the plates out of sight. Um, certainly, avoiding scrutiny is one, uh, you know, cynical interpretation of his motives. Um, and the idea that uh, he might have wanted to avoid theft is certainly borne out by, you know, all the stories of the local treasure hunters trying to steal the plates and him trying to hide it from them and running through the woods and supposedly somebody attacks him in the woods. So that certainly is part of the narrative that he's telling about the plates uh, is that people are trying to steal uh, them from him. But I really want to take seriously the quite explicit explanation of uh, why the plates are kept out of sight in Second Nephi. You know, this is providing an explanation not of, God, of Joseph's motives in keeping them out of sight, but of God's motives in keeping them out of sight. And it says, the words which are sealed, he shall not deliver, neither shall he deliver the book, for the book shall be sealed by the power of God, and the revelation which was sealed shall be kept in the book until the own due time of the Lord, that they may come forth, for behold, they reveal all things from the foundation of the world until the end thereof. So essentially, the idea is the sealed plates con contain all knowledge of human history, past, present, and future. And the world can't be trusted with that knowledge yet. And so Joseph Smith isn't allowed to deliver either the words of the sealed portion or the physical book because the world can't be allowed to have access to what's in the sealed portion. And so the, the sealed portion is held back, or sorry, the book of Mormon, the plates are held back in order to keep the sealed portion away from the world. And we also have um, other evidence of this. Uh, a number of different sources connect the um, the hiddenness of the Book of Mormon with the sealed portion. One of them is Martin Harris uh, says that when he went to Charles Anthon, Charles Anthon didn't want to translate from the transcript that Harris provided him. Charles Anthon asked for access to the actual plates and said that he would attempt a, a translation if he were presented with the physical plates. And Harris said, oh, I can't um, provide those to you because a portion of them are sealed. And so I have been forbidden to show them to anyone. Um, so again, he connects the hiddenness of the plates with the, the sealed portion and keeping the sealed portion away from the world. And so, you know, it, rather than coming up with uh, elaborate other explanations for why the plates were uh, kept sealed, I think we have to take fairly seriously the explanations that were quite explicitly given on that subject. Thank you. Um, Bill Moraine asks if he can share his screen. We're sorry, um, we can only, um, we only have the capability of the presenters to share the screen, so that won't be possible. And um, so that brings us to the end of our questions and probably the end of our time here. So I'd like to thank our panel who've done a great job tonight and thank you to everyone who's attended Please join us tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Central Time for our author meets critics discussion on Joseph and Lucy Smith's Tunbridge Farm, an archaeology and landscape study. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Cheryl. Excellent job to the entire panel. We're so grateful to all of you for this wonderful discussion. Um, on the scriptural periphery perspectives on Joseph Smith's Egyptian project. Thank you so much as well to uh, Christopher Smith, Susan Staker, and of course, David. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us. 
And as Cheryl said, we will be delighted to see you all tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock um, a.m. Central Time. Have a great evening. Thank you for being a part of our historic two-day conference. Good night. The John Whitmer Historical Association is proud to announce the coming arrival of WhitmerCast, a new podcast created by our members. In reflection of our annual conference, we will work with a variety of podcast hosts and historians to share the joy of restoration history with a broader audience. Podcasts will be released on a semi-regular basis, so stay tuned to our social media posts and website for new releases. We hope you enjoy the content.